Our next contributor, Rosalie became a worldwide sensation. One day you wake up, you write an article on the internet, and you find out it has been shared by millions. This is the story of our next speaker, a Silicon Valley engineer who became a global reference after posting several articles on coronavirus. The hammer and the dance is one of the most well-known. What had started as a Facebook post turned out into useful information for governments across the globe. I'm talking about Tomas Puello, the growth vice president at Cruz Hero. He knows what French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre meant when he said that words are loaded pistols. Tomas Puello's words became a hammer and a dance. Please welcome Tomas Puello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So what are you going to tell us today? Well, let's talk about the future of work and education. And obviously with the coronavirus, there's a question of how much of these changes will last? Uh, how much are we going to be using remote um, in the future and for work and for education? How much is going to replace the current uh, uh, use? And I think the 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 way we think about it, we think about it is up till now there was a little bit of remote work around five percent of employees knowledge workers were using remote work and then obviously with the coronavirus that explodes when it goes up as lockdowns start releasing that goes down but we should imagine what that would have been without the coronavirus right and it's probably it would probably have shown an s curve the penetration of remote work would have been slow at the beginning and then starts ramping up and then slow down again. And it's an S-curve because that's how many things in the world work. That's the way an epidemic uh, works. First is very, very slow, then it expands to everybody and then starts saturating the population and slows down again. Is the way memes work. First they're retweeted, for example, in a tweet by a few people, then everybody talks about it, and then it starts slowing down once most people have already talked about it. It is the way uh, nations change. There was a lot of change in um, the First World War, and then nothing in the 40s, then suddenly the Second World War, a lot of changes, and then nothing happened again until the 90s, where suddenly there's again a big change. These things don't happen little by little, they happen in S-curves, as we can see right now. Uh, it's the same for getting a job. You study for a long time, you start looking for something, and then you start interviewing, and very quickly, boom, you get the job. It's the same thing for a promotion. You work for a very long time for it until you get it, and then you don't have one for a long time. It is the way achievement work. It is, it is the way that companies go up or down. It is the way that even popcorn explodes. First, there's nothing. It's hitting, it's hitting, 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 and then suddenly, boom, it explodes, and then it stops again. It is the way muscles work. It is the way animation work. Slow, fast, slow. It is the way death works in life. It is the way companies grow. First, there's nothing. They're looking for product market feed. And they don't find product market feed. Then they have a hyper growth phase. Then they, they reach saturation and stagnation. And it is the way technology adoption works. First, you have early adopters who use it. And then everybody starts using it once it crosses the chasm. And then it starts slowing down again uh, when everybody that is meant to use it uh, is using it. And so the question is, for the coronavirus, this has changed the S-curve that we would have found otherwise. But what is the next S-curve going to be like? Is it going to be the way it would have been? Or is it going to be accelerated and going higher up? And the two key questions are, where is this invisible asymptote? Where is it going to start slowing down? And fast? how fast are we going to get there? Why are these the key questions? Because if adoption is really, really high, a lot of our life is going to change. For example, this is automatic. It's the company uh, behind WordPress, and they have around, I think, 1,200 employees all around the world. So it's already doable. And a lot of companies in Silicon Valley have decided already that they want to go uh, and be remote first uh, or allow a lot of remote work. Uh, you can see that more than 60% of employees in companies like Quora or other tech companies in the US and especially in Silicon Valley already think that um, they prefer remote work. Um, not only 
employees do want to do that, but also companies. Uh, for example, Facebook, uh, the median wage is around $250,000. So half of employees in Facebook make more than $250,000. So they have a huge incentive to go outside of Silicon Valley to employ people. So here's what's going to happen. If a lot of people uh, end up working remote very quickly, uh, you're going to have employees leaving uh, to cheaper areas because that way they can save more money. But also big companies are going to do the same. They're going to start looking for employees that are much cheaper in, uh, in other areas. Because if you have a $300,000 product manager in Silicon Valley, but instead of that, you can have a $50,000 product manager in Ukraine, and it's only 10, 20% worse, the benefit is huge. And so what's going to happen is white collar workers uh, are going to suffer because of globalization the way blue collar workers have suffered over the last few decades. So you can see that with globalization um, and the um, outsour like offshoring of uh, blue collar workers, blue collar work, uh, countries like China, Vietnam, have a massive amount of wealth uh, growth, and so their employees have also become much uh, richer. You also have the global elite who has been richer in the last few decades. But the middle classes in these countries have actually not seen their money grow. And probably the same thing is going to happen with remote work now. If your job, like a marketing manager or a product manager or a designer, can be done by a Ukrainian, by an Indian, for much cheaper, it will. So we need to be prepared for that. These are the types of massive changes that can happen. And the question becomes, how much then is that going to happen? Well, let's take, up the, let's take the office. For that to happen, you need the office to be replaceable. And to understand if it's replaceable, you need to uh, know what it, what it does. Uh, and what we think of the office is obviously a place for solo work. It is a place for meeting rooms. But it's substantially more than that. It is also knowing who is accessible right now and having immediate access to that person. It is to monitor productivity because you can see broadly who is sitting, who is not, who is working, who is not. You can get uh, people food so they can uh, they don't need to be cooking and they can be working more. Uh, you have informal ties, you have serendipity, socialization, you belong to a company, you can enforce the culture in the office much more easily. It's an easy way to show hierarchy who is at the top, who has the bottom. You can date. You uh, can force people to go out in the morning. Uh, it's an easy way to get stationary. It's an easy way to brainstorm. It's an easy way to give inspirational speeches, which is much harder over Zoom, and so on and so forth. So really, the office is a bundle of services. It is covering a bundle of needs. And we don't even understand what all these needs are. And for us to be able to replace it, we actually need to understand each one of these needs and replace with a similar tool or better that, uh, that need. But that has already happened in the past. Uh, Craigslist, for example, is a bundle of services. And over the years, each one of them has been picked apart and companies have been created to uh, fulfill that uh, service. The same thing for Excel. Excel is actually a bundle of services because it's very flexible. But each one of these use cases has been unbundled, has been attacked by a different company, and some of them are worth billions of dollars. And the same thing can happen with the office. Uh, each one of the services provided by the office is going to be, little by little, uh, replaced by an online tool. Uh, and as these tools get better and better, like Zoom, like Slack, uh, is going to be easier to uh, work remotely. So the market for remote work is going to be bigger. And so there's going to be more companies who want to do it and so on and so forth. And each one of these services that offices provide is in fact a, million, a billion dollar company. So there's a huge incentive to creating companies for all these services. And we can already see it with the thousands of companies that are being created to replace the office. Something very similar is going to happen with education. We have a massive amount of people uh, studying remotely um, during the coronavirus. And the question is, how fast after these are we going to move to remote work, remote education, and what is that um, invisible asymptote? 
And for that, we need to understand what is, again, the bundle of services provided by an education outlet. And my uh, focus is on higher education, universities, and similar. So I think it's interesting to understand what bundle of services is provided by a campus, right? Uh, everybody thinks, okay, most of a campus uh, is for learning, uh, but actually a lot of the value is in selection, right? A, a university like Stanford, for example, so that's only 6% of the people. So already the people com that are coming in are uh, potentially of a, of a higher caliber, and, and that shows uh, afterwards when they go to work. Uh, certification, certifying that the person has indeed worked for four years and has passed everything they need to pass. Signaling, right? Uh, 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 if you are willing to spend four years or five years in college, you are signaling that you believe as not so much in yourself, that you're willing to not make any money for years and pay um, uh, for your, um, your self-improvement. Belonging, friendships, um, hierarchy, special interest groups, dating, of course, uh, discipline discovery, right? You get all these new topics that you didn't know about and, and, you, and you start learning more about them. Intellectual stimulation, challenge, life experience. A lot of people want to go into campus because of the life experience. Obviously, job preparation, job matching, financing, and so on and so forth. So this is one of the reasons why universities and campuses haven't been replaced for centuries, because they are these bundle of services, and they might not be amazing at any of them, but it's very difficult to replace the bundle of services. And so if we think about how they're going to be replaced, uh, I think of, uh, obviously you have some specific uh, uh, services like Tinder. It's better at dating than campus, so you don't need a, camp you don't need a campus anymore to, to go and date. But I think a better example is something like Lambda University, Lambda School. So what they, this company does is you can come from anywhere. They select you, but you can come from anywhere. You study with them, and at the end, they match you with companies. And one of the keys is you actually don't pay up front. You uh, pay a share of your income for the next few years up to a certain amount. And that's how you pay for the education. So there's no risk whatsoever for yourself. And so what they're doing is out of a bundle of services, they're picking the few that are key for the core need that the user has, which is getting a job. And they're doing that better than campuses. And so we are going to see much more of that. Uh, you can see here, for example, these, these tweets. I don't know if Twitter has enough server space to handle all the tweets I could post about how Lambda School has changed my life. It changed the trajectory of my life in a way that defy comprehension and the laws of physics. With that level of feedback, you can imagine this is going places. So uh, these are all the, all the needs. And one of the ones that I want to focus on is learning. Because people assume that's the biggest and most important of the needs. And they assume that after centuries, it's well covered by campuses. But I don't think so. Right? Uh, you can look, for example, this is what education looks like today. And it very much looks like education decades or centuries ago. You have a person giving the content, then you have the, the, the pupils sitting uh, listening. And now you imagine that if online had worked really well, it would have completely changed that experience. But that's not the case. You go to a place, for example, like Coursera, and you have content organized in weeks. Weeks? Do I need to wait for weeks online to get my content? And then you go and you have a teacher, and a lot of that content uh, from a lot of teachers um, in, uh, in Coursera are talking heads. And that might work in a, in, a, in a classroom, but it doesn't work if you're in your underpants and you have Candy Crush on the side uh, uh, because you're going to pay attention to Candy Crush if it's boring. You know, by the way, in this situation, this is an instructional design professor. So this is at the top of um, learning uh, today. Right? Not only that, but Coursera, you need to pick a session. But on the internet, you need to pick a session for when you're going to study. And there's examples like these of the failure of learning online uh, uh, nearly everywhere. And that reminds me of uh, the history of cinema. This is The Great Dictator from 1940. And this is not really a movie, it's recorded theater. Why? Because at the time, uh, for, for millennia, uh, humans have done theater and they've learned 
all the tricks to do that really well and make it engaging. So once you have a camera, what are you going to do? Are well, you going to just shoot whatever you know, which is theater? And in, like, look at how that changes just the year after. This is Season Kane, 1941. Right? And you can already see the camera now is moving dramatically. And the composition is key, is key. You have this woman at the center because she's so important. Now you have three planes. You have the people in the foreground, the, the kid in the background. You have the man in the, in the middle ground. And this composition is telling you a lot of what's happening. You have the two people who are uh, allies on the right and the person who is separated on the left. The person who's separated is not as important, so that that person is not in the middle of the frame. If she, he becomes more important, suddenly the camera moves. And as the person loses importance, again, the camera tilts and focuses again on the people who are more important and who won. All throughout, we saw the kid, and now we're going back and we're looking at the kid and now the face of the woman who is the most important person and you want to focus on her emotional attachment. And so this is how movies were completely reinvented based on the new tool. And so the question for education is what would a true education be like if it was rebuilt for online? What would learning be like? And you probably want to gamify it a little, a little bit you want to obviously have some video explanations. Maybe you want to ask questions anonymously because you're ashamed of uh, asking stupid questions. You want to celebrate when somebody wins. You want to prove that the content is the right one. You want to have some storytelling, have a, a sense of belonging, maybe give true actual rewards, maybe give triggers so that people can come back to study. Maybe you get a, give a good sense of progressions to know, oh yes, you know, I am learning a lot. I feel good about myself maybe personalize all that content, and so on and so forth. But what's true is that at some point, learning is going to be better online than offline. And at some point, all of these other services that are provided by a campus are going to be better on uh, online. And so will remote replace offline? I think it's a question of time. Remote will replace online. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us, Tomas, but don't leave us uh, yet because there is someone else here with us uh, who has some questions for you. Please welcome Juan Jose Güemes, President of Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at IE Business School. Juan Jose, it's all yours. Hi, Marta. Hi, Tomas. Welcome to Enlighted. Hi. I hope you come soon to I'm Spain happy to be here. And, and to welcome you at IE University soon. I hope so. So, um, Tomas, you, I mean, you have been talking about disruption in, in education. How long is it going to take place to be a complete disruption in higher education and education in general? I think higher education is pretty safe uh, uh, because it is a bundle of all these services and we didn't even realize what this bundle of services was. And it's very, very hard to replace each one of these services, right? Uh, learning uh, is probably one of the easiest ones, I would say. Certification might be harder because they rely on a brand and it's very, very hard to build a brand. When you're talk, we're talking about Lambda School, well, they need to build a brand before everybody trusts them. And that takes a lot of, a lot, lot of time. Um, the, the, and, and so what I think is going to happen is that some pieces, some uh, uh, some of these services are going to be replaced earlier than others, and some of them are never going to be easily replaced. For example, the life experience, it's extremely unlikely that you, create, that you can create that uh, life experience online. It's very probably hard to create this level of friendships um, online. And so what I would say is it is going to be faster than we think right now, but especially on some services, that means that uh, the schools that are that are focused on these services and are now worse than the digital version, those are the ones that are going to disappear. And the schools that play on their strengths, on the things that cannot be done online, and they focus on that, those ones are going to be the winners. But overall, most are going to be losing, the same way as travel agencies uh, lost 20 years ago. 
And why? Because you build once an amazing travel agency online, and then suddenly all the travel agencies that had a geogra geographic monopoly disappear. The same thing is going to happen uh, online. If you have an amazing experience online, that is better. That's going to be better than hundreds or thousands of schools worldwide. Then many of them are going to disappear. Hey, Thomas, according to Christensen, who unfortunately uh, passed away during uh, during uh, this period, we all were confined all over the world. Uh, according to Christensen, disruptive innovation is such kind of innovation that makes complex and expensive products and services to be much cheaper and much simpler and then accessible to the most. So wh what do you think is going to change in education, in uh, not only the way we deliver education, but also in the financial model, to make it more affordable, cheaper, simpler, and then accessible to, for the most? Yeah, it's interesting because um, Clay Christensen is also the person who is behind uh, modularity theory, which is this concept of bundling and unbundling, right? You have a bundle of services provided by the office, a bundle of services provided by schools, and, uh, and it gives a sense of when and how is that going to be replaced by something different, by something modular. And the answer is, uh, well, if you can do each one of these services independently, then uh, it becomes much more modular, right? The way a computer, for example, it can be modular uh, because you have the processor and the, the, the battery can be a different company and the montage can be different and the monitor can be different, right? So once these things can easily talk to each other, suddenly it becomes modular. But when you need all of these things to uh, talk very well together uh, in a way that is not uh, standardized, that is when you have a player that um, uh, that has a benefit by putting all of this together. Right? So that's really the benefit that offices and campuses have today. They have this disparate uh, number of um, services, uh, and it's uh, very hard to modularize them, just have one and the other separate. And so that's why they, they are uh, they've, they've been very hard to replace. I think the two keys, uh, one of them is what you said, the cost, right? Especially in the United States, when it costs you tens of thousands of dollars uh, upfront to to get your uh, your diploma, and you can go to something like uh, Lambda School, where it's free upfront, there's no risk, there's a huge advantage there, right? And, and, and really, the, that is that comes from the fact that digital products have very low marginal costs. Right? It's a, a big upfront cost to build a tool, but afterwards, adding one more person is not that expensive. Conversely, in the real world, adding one more student is indeed very expensive. So you have these economic huge advantage that online has uh, to, um, to, replace, uh, to replace offline. And the other one is uh, an educator, for example, because that person is forced on meeting new students, on uh, giving a class, on correcting exams, on designing the exam, and the, the, that educator needs to do that every quarter or every year, uh, you, uh, you have very little time uh, to start to think and focus on one amazing experience that then uh, happens over and over again. And that's the other benefit that digital tools have, right? You only need to build it once, and you can focus tens of people on doing that amazingly, and then you put that outside. Which is why I think one of the experiences, that one of the, the things that we're going to experience is superstar educators. We're already starting to see it, but we're going to see more of that. Can from Simon Can from Khan Academy, in fact, is a superstar educator, right? They create amazing content, so good that suddenly everybody consumes that content, uh, and you only need to do it once not every time. And that's a huge, huge economic advantage. I'm coming back to your vision of, of uh, university campuses as a bundle of services. Um, so out of every dollar you paid for tuition to Stanford, your alma mater, how much did you pay for learning? How much did you pay for dating or for social networking or for uh, feeling different yeah. or for I think the, 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 the key one here is the common intuition that is completely wrong about how important learning is. And here's a few examples, right? Um, 
if teaching was so important, uh, if learning was so important, teaching would be extremely important, except that most educators, especially in the US, but across the globe, are not, in the university, are not rated by how good educators they are, most. They are rated by how much research they do and how good research is. So if learning was really, really, really that important, that's how we'll be rating educators. Uh, a couple more examples. Uh, when somebody can study biology and then start working as a product manager, right, or a designer, these things happen a lot. If the content of what you learned was so important, that would not happen. Yet another example. Uh, the um, income that you get per year of university studied, if learning was the most important thing, that income would grow proportionally, right? You uh, study one year, you get a bump of 10% of income. Another year, 20%, 30, 40%. That's if learning was important, was the key. But what we see is that actually it does not grow linearly, it grows like this. It's, you have a little bit bump, a little bump for uh, the first year, and then the second one a little bit more, then a third. But the time you graduate is when you get the really big bump. That makes no sense. Well, it makes because one of the key reasons why you're studying is actually not to learn. It is to prove that you can go day in, day out for four years and do whatever you're told um, in knowledge uh, work and study something, understand something, and pass the exam. And that is the skill that you want uh, for, for work. And so if you prove that for four or five years, you can be doing whatever you're told, um, that's what the certification uh, uh, says about you. And so that's why the certification is much more valuable, in fact, than the learning. So back to your point on, on the value from, from uh, Stanford, I think one of the key values of Stanford is actually the selection. It's around five, six percent in the MBA of people uh, who get selected. And then you have an amazing group of people all in one place, and you can let these people do whatever they want uh, because they're going to be overachievers no matter what. Um, and so the selection is, is, is massive. Uh, the certification is not as important. It, it matters, but it's not as important. The learning uh, for me was very valuable, uh, but it's definitely not the biggest one. I think the stand behind Stanford is probably the biggest one. And then close to that, the social networks. Just this selection of people, when you're all, the, all, all of um, us together in one place and you get to know these amazing people that inspires you, that gives you ideas, that gives you tools and, and contacts, obviously, for, for your professional um, life afterwards. So I would say selection, certification, and social networks were by far the biggest values. Learning was here and other things like dating, not so much more. And, and which of those uh, services will be um providing campus and, and what others may be taking over by new players in the in the industry of education? Yeah, I think the the the, the, the the what scares me the most about higher education is that some of the biggest values, the things that are most valuable, uh, can be replaced relatively easily. So the underlying reason why people go to university usually is for income. They want a job. And um, what they learn, the certification, the selection, is valuable for that. And uh, so you take something like Lambda School, and I think the bundle of services that they picked is very, very clever. It's very focused on the uh, job side. It's telling you within a few months, I'm going to get you from wherever you are to this place where you're going to get make substantially more money. It's focused on the job, and so if you and they're doing all the services that you need to do that well, right? They're learn, they're teaching you obviously, but they're selecting. There's huge, there's a huge selection to participate in the program. Um, there's amazing financing. Uh, and they're very, very focused on placing students in companies, and they're doing that really, really, really well. And so you have these uh, these institution that has been really intelligent on the subset of the services to replace. And my guess is there's going to be more like it, and also it's going to be keep grow growing really, really, really fast. And so the question becomes for 
um, other higher education um, organizations, like what can they do to fight this? And uh, back to Clay Christensen, one of them is, is going to be, um, they, they need to understand that they're going to be disrupting themselves. They need to be disrupting themselves in one area. And the second is they have to focus on the areas where they are the strongest. And offline is strongest in the human connection. And so focusing a lot on who you meet, creating amazing experiences, creating, creating live, uh, uh, lifelong relationship and friendships, creating an amazing network of alumni. These things are going to be harder to replace online. And I think the winners are going to uh, be blended education, but the offline piece of it is going to focus on that. Okay, Tomas, and my last question is to give you the chance to be um, a little bit provocative. In five years' time, in 10 years' time, there will be more or fewer universities. And how universities will like look, will look like? In five to 10 years, there's definitely going to be fewer universities. Um, all the ones that won because they had just a geographic monopoly, meaning that they get the students from their area, all of these are going to lose. Um, the ones that made a lot of money, for example, from um, foreign workers, um, from foreign students or from local students, uh, it's going to be harder for them to compete when you have a product that's strictly better. I think the ones that are going to survive are the ones that have an amazing brand, like Stanford's, Harvard's, Concentrate Paris in France, for example, uh, Polytechnique. Uh, as the top one, two, three percent of students um, want to go today, in five years, the brand is still going to be very valuable. So even if your addressable market shrinks by 50 percent, you still have the top that still wants to go to these schools. I think the, the, the ones that are going to be replaced are the ones who are, for example, more like focused on specific jobs, such as um, a computer de developer, that's one of the groups that Lambda School is targeting. Uh, and more importantly, those where they have this geographic um, uh, monopoly. Thank you very much, Tomas. Uh, may the fourth be with you. And I hope to see you soon <laughs> in Madrid or, or Asturias um, pretty soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Coco. It's been a pleasure.